Hi everyone, welcome to our Realities of Ebook Distribution webcast. My name is Sarah O'Keefe and I've also got Alan Pringle on the line who's going to be doing this, this webcast. Just wanted to give you a couple of quick things before we get started. The number one question that people ask us about our webcast is are they being recorded and the answer is yes. So within typically 24 to 48 hours after we get the webcast done, you will receive a link to the recording um, on SlideShare. So that was item one. Uh, item two was I wanted to let you know that we do have a number of other webcasts and other events coming up. They are on our events page, which is scriptorium.com slash events. And in particular, I wanted to mention that we have an April 30th webcast with uh, Scott Abel and a couple of other analysts talking about trends in technical communication and what some industry surveys are showing. So if you get a chance, you might want to go and take a look at that one and sign up for that. And with that, I will turn it over to Alan. Alan, are you there? I am here. All right. Well, take it away. OK. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Alan Pringle. And this is the realities of ebook e distribution webcasts. And I do want to make a note of today's date, April 11, 2013, because the ebook distribution industry and ebooks in general are changing so rapidly. What I am telling you today could easily be outdated tomorrow. So as of today, as far as I know, what I'm about, what I'm about to tell you is indeed accurate. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my experience with ebooks. Um, I'm the director of operations at Scriptorium. Part of my responsibility is to run Scriptorium's publishing imprint, Scriptorium Press. Um, I've co-authored three books uh, through Scriptorium Press, Content Strategy 101, The State of Structure Authoring, and Technical Writing 101. We have released um, electronic versions of all three of those books. And my experience with creating and distributing those books makes up about a lot of what I'm about to tell you. So uh, let's move forward and just to kind of get an idea um, of what you know uh, and do with ebooks right now, I want to do a quick poll about whether you read ebooks and whether you distribute ebooks. So let me bring up that poll and start it so we can see who does what. And it is multiple choice. You can pick both. OK. Let's go ahead and close that out. And it looks like practically everyone reads ebooks among our audience, and only 10 to 10% 10 distributes. So I'm hoping a lot of what I'm about to tell you will indeed be news to you. And to kind of get things started, what I want to talk about first are the formats for ebooks. Right now, the basically de facto standard is EPUB. And EPUB is an open standard. It's defined by the International Digital Publishing Forum, IDPF. And EPUB is essentially a collection of HTML files, style sheets for formatting, and baggage files that, for example, control the order of the content that are all compressed together into a zip file that has a .epub file extension. Um, there are tons of free e-reader uh, free EPUB reader applications out there. You can look at EPUB on your computer, laptop, tablet, smartphone. It's, it's pretty much universal at this point that you should be able to find a reader for whatever device that you're doing, you, know, you want to read an EPUB on. Um, there have been some changes recently with EPUB. In October 2011, the IDPF released um, the EPUB 3.0 specification. Uh, this new standard enables more complex layouts, interactivity, rich media inclusion, and things like that. And for you techie folk out there, it's HTML5 under the hood that's enabling a lot of this, uh, the new jazzy features. Um, the problem with EPUB 3 right now is that support on devices and apps is very far from universal at this point. But I do expect, based on reading I've seen on blogs and stuff, 
sometime this year you are going to see more and more devices supporting the 3.0 standard. Because of this problem with you know, the version 2 spec versus the uh, version 3 spec and not all devices handling them both, right now Scriptorium is sticking to the 2.0 standard for the stuff we release just to be sure our stuff is compatible, you know, backwards compatible with um, older readers. Um, this is a whole lot like um, the situation with web browsers and any of you who are in techcom or really any kind of uh, uh, business that deals with web browsers and web content, older web browsers a lot of times cannot handle uh, some of the coding that the newer browsers can and it's the same exact problem. You've got to kind of think about to keep your stuff backwards compatible. Yeah, there's a lot of neat new features that you can do with EPUB 3, but if someone's device doesn't support it or the majority of your audience's devices don't support it, it's not very useful, which is why that we are indeed for now sticking with EPUB 2. Um, as far as EPUBs and being sure your stuff sticks to the standards, there, is, there are validators that you can run your file through to be sure that it indeed adheres to the specs for EPUB. Uh, the IDPF does provide a hosted validator. Um, that's at validator.idpf.com and it will validate both, both against the version 2 and version 3 specs. Um, you can also install the validator uh, locally on your machine and run it through a command prompt, but it is mighty convenient to be able to upload a file. I believe the IDPF validator lets you upload a file up to 10 meg, and you can check it that way. Uh, before there was EPUB, there were lots of other formats, um, including MOBI, which is short for Moby Pocket. Um, the Moby Pocket, Moby Pocket format was also based on a standard that preceded EPUB called the Open eBook Specification. Um, Moby was very popular and really came about in the days of PDAs. You remember personal digital assistants? Um, that's where Moby really came into play um, and a lot of devices made by Palm, for example, could read the Moby format. Um, the Moby format itself, compared to H, uh, excuse me, compared to EPUB, is much more limited in what it can do um, as far as formatting goes. It has this quasi HTML, sort of kind of HTML tagging, and like I said, you're really sort of limited, particularly in regard to what it can do with table handling. And I have lots of stuff about that. I'll tell you about later. Um, today, Moby is still in use primarily as a format for your dedicated electronic ink, e-ink readers. Um, I have an e-ink reader, an older Kindle. You know, those are the ones that uh, basically they aren't tablets. They are basically just exclusively for e-reading. Um, most of them are not backlit, although some of them now are. So Moby files uh, really is to today is basically used for those e-ink devices, uh, primarily Kindles. Now even though we've got two perfectly, perfectly good ways to put out content, EPUB and Mobi, that is not good enough for the big players in the e-book distribution business. No, they are not happy following standards, doing what everybody else has been doing. They felt the need to add their own spins to these formats. And these proprietary formats include the AZW and KF8 formats for the Amazon Kindle and books, ebooks generated from the Apple iBooks author app, which Apple refers to as multi-touch books. Let me tell you a little bit about these formats. The AZW format, it's basically a highly compressed Mobi file with Amazon's own proprietary digital rights management slapped on top of it. So it's a Mobi file for all intents and purposes. In fact, Amazon actually bought the Mobi Pocket company, um, and Mobi Pocket uh, produced the Mobi Pocket Reader for PDAs. Uh, Amazon bought them in 2005, and they have pretty much slowly started to kill that company and the whole MobiPocket.com um, site uh, since then. Uh, just last year, Amazon quit selling Mobi books on the Mobi Pocket website 
and basically folded in sales completely from that into its Kindle platform. So they took the Moby Pocket format, the website, and pretty much made it into its own proprietary thing. Hmm. That's kind of nice, isn't it? Um, it gets even better, actually, with KF8. Um, the KF8 format came about with the advent of the Kindle Fire tablets. Um, what the KF8 is, is they took the, an EPUB file and a Mobi file and combined them together into one file. That way the tablets can show the more highly designed EPUB type format. And then the older devices can look at the older school Mobi format. And I know this thanks to Liz Castro. Uh, she's a computer book writer. She has a really good blog that I recommend called Pigs, Gourds, and Wikis, pigsgourdsandwikis.com. And that site has a lot of good information about e-publishing. Uh, she used a free tool called Mobi Unpack to peek inside the KF8 file for one of her books only to discover in there there was a Mobi file and an EPUB file that she could pull out and then look at you know, on her devices. So, like I said, Amazon is taking basically two standards, munging them together to create, to create its, its own thing. Um, Apple, however, is also guilty of this. Uh, Amazon's not the only one doing this. In January of last year, you may have heard the big hullabaloo when Apple released the iBooks Author app. Through iBooks Author, um, you can create these multi-touch books that are basically interactive e-books. Um, if you look under the covers, those books are EPUB files with some additions and extensions that make them incompatible with any other EPUB reader. You have to use the iBooks app on an iPad to read these uh, books. So it's EPUB with a little special something thrown on top to make it incompatible with other items. So as you can see, both Amazon and Apple have taken standard formats and kind of done their own thing to them. Now we've kind of got the formats out of the way, I can tell you how we distribute uh, our books that are in EPUB and Kindle format. Right now, our primary selling venue is through our online store, the Scriptorium Emporium. That's at storescriptorium.com. Um, that is our primary sales channel. We established that store several years ago, actually to sell printed copies of our book. But as of now, we no longer sell any printed content through that store and sell downloads exclusively. We sell one or two PDFs, but mostly EPUB versions of our books. Uh, we also sell Kindle versions of our books through Amazon. And up until the end of last month, we sold EPUB files in the Apple, Books, uh, Apple iBook store. Uh, we actually quit selling them, like I said, about, I think I shut that off around March 30th, somewhere around there. I said, no, we're done. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but I can say from an information consumer point of view, I love my iPad. I love the way that I can, you know, read all sorts of stuff and consume information. However, as a publisher, I am not so happy about some of the things that Apple has done, particularly in regard to how they support uh, their, their publishers. Let's talk about the distribution channels, which are primarily Apple and Amazon. In the Apple Books, in the Apple iBook Store, you can sell standard EPUB files, which is exactly what we used to do. You basically create an account for selling books, and you have to use an application called iTunes Producer to upload them. By the way, that is a Mac-only application. Uh, you can see reports of your selling, of what you're selling, uh, through any web browser on any system, any operating system. But as far as actually establishing and uploading your files, you do have to use a Mac. Um, you can, in addition to selling EPUBs there, you can also use the iBooks Author app that I told you about to create the multi-touch eBooks. If you do sell a multi-touch eBook or you create a multi-touch eBook through that application, 
you are required to exclusively sell that through Apple's bookstore. Um, a lot of people were up in arms about that. I wasn't that bothered by it. Basically, they're giving you a decent piece of software with a decent GUI on it to make an ebook. And from my point of view, that's sort of the price you pay for um, being able to, you know, quickly and easily create a book. Uh, when you do upload a file to the Apple Bookstore, you get to specify your pricing for different regions. For example, when we put our Technical Writing 101 book up there, the iTunes Connect system asked uh, what the pricing was for the print version of that book because they, um, they are going to base basically a group of tiers that they're going to present to you base that on the print cost. Our book was $35.95 in print, so they turned around and presented us with multiple tiers. Tier 0 was free, Tier 1 is $0.99 cents and so on, up to Tier 36, which is um, $35.99, and that's the equivalent of the, of the print book. In the United States, we chose to sell our book for $9.99. Uh, that matches the price of that same title in our own uh, online store. Uh, that's one other catch about selling through the iBookstore. If you sell through there, you have to basically match or go lower price-wise. Uh, so there is a price matching requirement there. When you do, um, when it is time to get your money, you get set a 70% cut of your sales. Apple gets 30%. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's cut and dried, 70-30. That's their model. Uh, that 30% commission doesn't offend me. You know, the requirement to sell multi-touch books after using their software to create it, that actually doesn't offend me either. What has offended me as a publisher is, especially early on, Apple's support for publishers was just poor. There is no nice, there's just no nice way to say it. It was poor. They were not clear about the specifications for um, what your EPUB files should be to get clearance to get posted. You could have a perfectly valid EPUB file and they still would reject it. So yeah, it may have passed validation from the online validator, but there's something in it that Apple doesn't like. And so they said, no, you've got to fix it. We once had a book rejected for publication, but the reason was never specified, so I wanted to know why, and I sent them an email. It took them two and a half months to respond to the email, and it turned out that the size of our cover image wasn't quite what they wanted. To me, to wait two and a half months to hear that, <laughs> to say that's unacceptable would be an understatement. I just threw my hands up at this point and I said, that's it. We are just going to distribute that title through our own website. I was kind of done with them at that point. Uh, it was an easy decision to make not to sell that particular title through the iBookstore because our sales of Technical Writing 101 through that, through the iBookstore have been paltry compared to the sales in our own online store and the Kindle version on Amazon. So from my point of view is I was tired of paying um, Amazon, excuse me, Apple 30%, basically $3 a pop for the few, type, the few versions we were selling of Technical Writing 101. So at the end of March, I just decided altogether to pull that book from the iBookstore. And that was the last book that we sold there. So we don't sell there anymore. And we, like I said, we sell EPUBs now exclusively through our own online store. That's my experience. There are other publishers, especially publishers of children's books that I know have had a lot of, exper a lot of good experience, exposure, and great sales through. Apple, um, we are not among those publishers, unfortunately. I want to talk a little bit about Amazon now. Uh, to create a Kindle version, you can take uh, an existing EPUB file and run it through some free tools that Amazon will offer to you. Uh, there's one that's on the command line called Kindle Gen. There is also the free Kindle Previewer tool which basically puts an interface on top of Kindle Gen and also lets you see what a converted EPUB looks like on the many different Kindle devices. And there is a large family of Kindle devices right now that you have to be prepared to support. 
Now when we do our conversions to Kindle, there is a little bit of manual fudging we do on our EPUB files, uh, including adding a TOC table of contents file specifically for the Kindle edition. And it's not a very hard thing to do, all in all. Um, and after creating the Kindle file, we upload those files um, through our account, uh, Amazon account, for the Kindle Direct Publishing Program. That's KDP for short. Um, I'll give Amazon credit. The fact that we can use an EPUB as a starting point makes me happy because for us that represents basically 85 to 90 percent of the work we need to do to get a Kindle file out there and just run it through a conversion with some minimal work. That, that makes me happy as a publisher that I don't have to spend a lot of time creating something specifically for Amazon. And I should note, uh, to my knowledge uh, up to this time, you cannot use an EPUB file, open it in Apple iBooks Author. Uh, you have to start from scratch. I do wonder one day if that might change, but as of now, my understanding is you basically start from the ground up. There is no EPUB import uh, for the Apple iBooks program. Uh, as far as getting paid by Amazon, um, there are some pricing requirements similar to Apple. You um, basically can't, if you go through the KDP program, you can't sell the Kindle edition for more than you sell an electronic edition elsewhere. So for example, our Technical Writing 101 book, it's $9.99 up on Amazon for the Kindle edition. That matches the $9.99 pricing in our own online store. As far as getting royalties, payments for what you sell on Amazon, you've got, um, through the KDP program, you've got two tiers for royalties, 70% or 35%. So you're probably thinking to yourself, why on earth would you pick just 35%? It's half of 70. Actually, there are some times where it's a better choice. And let me kind of break it down for you uh, for those two different tiers. Excuse me. For the 70% model, that basically means you get a 70% royalty for most regions in which you sell your content, and that includes the United States. For newer markets that include Japan, India, and Brazil, you get just 35%. Uh, for the 70% royalty, your pricing needs has to be between $299 and $999 US dollars. Um, and there is, as I mentioned, the price matching issue. You can't sell it for more, or excuse me, sell it for less elsewhere. Um, if Amazon does see that you were selling your book for elsewhere, they will actually uh, price match and then calculate your royalties. So they apparently do pay attention to that. I read some stories from some disgruntled folks on different um, bulletin boards complaining about that. Um, in addition to the 70% royalty, or Amazon taking 30%, basically, a 30% cut, they also will charge you a data delivery charge for every sale. They deduct that data delivery charge from the price of the book and then calculate your royalty. And here's an example. In the U.S., they charge 15 cents per megabyte. Uh, the Technical Writing 101 book in Kindle format is 2.6 meg, and that means Amazon charges us 31 cents for each download. So if you have a lot of images in your book, very image intensive EPUB file, the 70% model really may not be a good choice for you. Something else I do want to mention is um, we include in our EPUB files open source fonts to give it sort of a custom look, but we strip them out before uh, from an EPUB file before we convert that EPUB to Kindle, and there's two reasons for this. First of all, uh, custom fonts don't work on the e-ink Kindles, um, and also having those fonts in that EPUB zip file actually makes the file size bigger, so why do I want to leave those in there and increase my distribution costs? Uh, so File size is absolutely something you have to consider before you just blindly say, oh yes, the 70% model is for me. 
the 35% model may be better because there are no delivery charges, which is pretty good if you've got you know, a lot of images in a book, for example, a textbook or something that um, is very technical with lots of images in it. Uh, you get a 35% royalty flat for sales in all regions, and you can also set the price or higher than $9.99. So that's why you'll see some um, books, you know, selling for basically close to the print cost. Um, that is probably because, A, there are tons of images or something that makes a file size large, and B, the publisher um, uh, really wants to make some money. When you're only getting 35%, you know, you do have to jack that price up. So I have some degree of sympathy for, for that. And I, and I understand a lot of users say, why are people charging print prices for ebooks? Well, this is why. I do want to let you know there is another program that can affect the 70% royalty rate. It's called KDP Select. Um, if you join the KDP Select program, you can get the 70% in those new markets, Japan, India, Brazil. Um, also, um, there are some other possible perks for being in the select program. Uh, you can distribute your books through the Kindle Owners Lending Library. Um, I don't know how many of you are members of the Amazon Prime program, but let me give it a quick rundown to explain to the folks who may not know what that is. Um, you, if you're an Amazon Prime member, uh, this is for folks in the U.S., U.K., Germany, and France. You pay Amazon an annual fee, and in exchange for that fee, you get expedited shipping on all the merchandise you buy. That's the primary reason. There are two, you know, uh, sort of fringe benefits for that, too. At least in the U.S., you get to um, look at a lot of streaming videos, uh, included in that fee, and you also get to um, get uh, free Kindle books through a lending library. I believe you get, once a, you get one book a month. So, you know, if you're a newer author and you want to get your stuff out there, having your book available for, for free for Amazon Prime members might be a big deal to you. There is one big catch for publishers, distributors, in regard to the KDP Select and the Lending Library. And that is, if you are in KDP Select, you have to sell the electronic version of your book only through Amazon. You can't sell it in EPUB format in your own store or elsewhere. You have to sell Kindle only through them. Um, for us at Scriptorium, that exclusivity is a deal breaker. Uh, I don't want to lock my sales down just to Amazon especially considering we sell most of our books through our own store and make more money. So for us, that exclusivity doesn't interest me any more than, say, the exclusivity of making a nice multi-touch book through um, Apple's iBooks author program. For us, that exclusivity makes no sense. For someone else, it may be a different story. Amazon and Apple are the big players in this game. There are other options, though. Um, Barnes & Noble is another option. Um, they have what they call the PubIt program. Uh, you can upload an EPUB file to Barnes & Noble, and they'll pay you a royalty of 65% for books priced between, I think, $2.99 and $9.99 U.S. dollars. Um, you can also work with a company like Lulu.com, and Lulu, for example, will handle the distribution of your book both in print and EPUB. And they will even work with Apple to get your stuff in the iBookstore. They don't work with Amazon, though, so if you want to work, get your stuff up to Amazon as Kindle, you're going to have to do that yourself. Of course, then another option is what we've done at Scriptorium, and that is sell direct. Um, you know, if you're selling EPUB files, you do need to ask yourself, does it make sense to, you know, pay Apple and Barnes & Noble 30 to 35 percent to sell those EPUB files when you can maybe do it yourself? While the idea of making more money may be appealing, there are lots of things you need to think about before you decide to, you know, sell the stuff on your own. Uh, and the big thing you really need to think about is the cost and risk associated with accepting credit cards. 
it's a big deal. Um, if you want to go full-blown with your credit card processing, you have to obtain a merchant account, which allows you to accept credit cards. You pay a small percentage of your sales to the credit card companies for each purchase. You pay a monthly fee for the credit card processing to your gateway, and it just goes on and on. And yes, you can get nickel and dimed to death with this stuff. Um, and if you don't want to deal with setting up a merchant account, you can consider a service like PayPal. They're an, you know, they're an aggregator. They, they will kind of be the middleman for you and handle that stuff. Sure, your per cost transaction may be a little higher, but that's what you get for the convenience of using a service like PayPal. Um, and there's something else that you need to really be aware of when you accept credit cards. Um, yeah, you've got to pay all these transaction fees, but there's something else that's very important, and that is ensuring that your transactions adhere to the regulations of the PCI, that's Payment Card Industry Regulations. Uh, in essence, these rules basically tell you what you have to do to be sure that uh, your customer's credit card information is safe. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's a lot you have to be concerned about. And merely having a secure you know, web page is only a very small fraction of what you have to deal with. Uh, from my point of view, the smart thing to do to handle PCI compliance is to find a store, online store provider service that is PCI compliant, and basically that way you know those headaches onto them. You don't have to deal with them. Um, and with that cost you've got to think about. On top of all the credit card processing costs, you also have to calculate in the cost of your shopping cart service or whatever you use to sell your stuff to folks. Uh, we use a service called Easy Store Creator. They are PCI compliant. Uh, we've been using them for years, and I have to say we have been happy with them. Uh, if you don't want to go the route of setting up a whole full-blown online store, uh, there's some other services that you can uh, rely on to sell stuff on your own site. Uh, one of these services is called Gumroad, and that's G-U-M-R-O-A-D. You can see them at gumroad.com. Uh, for Gumroad, they'll charge you a 25% uh, excuse me, a flat fee of 25 cents, not percent, 25 cents for each transaction on top of a 5% charge for the transaction. So uh, if you've got a $10 item you're selling, they'll knock off a quarter for the flat fee, and then that's what, uh, 50 cents for the, um, the transaction cost. You're looking at basically losing, what, 75 cents out of a $10 transaction to, to sell something through them. Um, beyond the whole credit card processing and PCI compliance, another really important issue you have to think about if you decide to sell just through your own site, you better be sure that your website is really super optimized for Google and all the other search engines, because if people search for the title of your book and you don't come up in the first results, you're not going to sell any. So you really got to think about that as, as, as as important or more important than actually getting all the behind the scenes money, you know, transaction stuff set up. So absolutely keep that effort in mind when you're calculating uh, your costs. So there's a lot to think about with the distribution channel. Should I go with Apple? Should I go with Amazon? Both? Should I do it on my own? But beyond that, you also uh, need to take a look at how different devices display your content differently. You can see I've got a nice image of fruit salad here, and it's actually making me hungry because it's lunchtime on the East Coast. But basically, you will be amazed at how different e-readers will slice and dice your EPUB. And the results are not nearly as appealing as what you're seeing right here. I can assure you of that. And I have dealt with this more times than I care to admit. I want to give you a quick peek um, at how the different devices can render your content by showing you the first uh, chunk of content in Chapter 1 of our State of Structured Authoring Report that Sarah O'Keefe and I published in 2011. Here it is, uh, the first page, or the first chunk of the chapter one shown on Barnes & Noble's Nook color device. Uh, the Nook color has a skinnier display, 
So your line lengths are a little shorter, and the and if you've got bigger tables, they do don't look super attractive because of that narrow uh, screen display. You do have to scroll over to see your table, so that's a little bit bothersome uh, for publishers who had to kind of think about that. Um, one thing I do like about the Nook color is that it preserves custom fonts. The fonts you're seeing here are ones that we embedded. They are not the default fonts on the Nook color. Uh, and I should say, in the Nook's defense, or Barnes & Noble defense, there they have put out some newer, more tablet-sized devices since the Nook Color, so they do have wider screens now. Uh, that said, um, just because newer devices are bigger, wider, as a publisher, you have to think about the folks who have, you know, the model from two years ago because people are still using them, and that's the case with the Nook Color. I'd say that's what's been out for about two years now. Um, here is that same chunk of content shown in the Adobe Digital Editions Reader. Uh, that is some software that you can download to your, to your PC or your um, Mac. Um, what you're seeing right now is uh, from a screenshot from my Windows 7 machine. Um, I do like the wide width. Uh, because you're, the, the reader is going to be on a computer screen, they can drag it wider. They've got a little more latitude because they've got the entire screen of a computer uh, monitor uh, to, to take up. So that's good. Uh, it also preserves the custom fonts, and I do like that. So all in all, I like Adobe Digital Editions. Um, I think it's a useful tool, and if you ever do need to read an a EPUB file on your desktop, uh, check it out. And let me also show you what that looks like on the iBooks app on an iPad. Um, the iPad does ignore custom fonts. It uses its own. But overall, I, I have to say, book EPUBs look really good on the, um, in the iBooks app. I, I can't complain. It looks really nice, and it's a good user experience, too. Uh, I have not seen what this looks like on an iPad Mini. I suspect that table is a little bit squished, but I have not seen one of those, so I can't tell you. That is from a standard size iPad 2, mine actually. Let's shift a little bit from EPUB to what this stuff looks like on the Kindle. Um, I mentioned this to, to you earlier that Amazon provides a free tool called the Kindle Previewer, um, and it will let you open up uh, an EPUB file and see what the content will look like. This is what that sh same chunk of content from the um, State of Structured Authoring Report looks like on a Kindle. Uh, doesn't look great. Um, there's some weird wrapping in the tables down there. You can see the percent sign is wrapping down to the second line. Um, not great, but not you know unusable either. So that's okay. However, other tables in the Kindle are a huge problem. And I want to first show you in that report a larger table, what that looks like in an EPUB in Adobe Digital Editions. It's what got five columns. It looks decent. It's readable in the EPUB file. However, let me show you <laughs> what happens to it in the Kindle device. I like to call the Kindle the table killer because that's what it does. As you can see, because the, the Kindle is pretty narrow, it lops off the table right about what? The, the fourth column, it just cuts it in half. Not great. Also what I don't like about the Kindle is that it puts the um, table caption into the first cell of the table. I think that's kind of ugly. That's just what it does by default. Let me show you what it looks like now on one of the Kindle Fire tablets. It doesn't look great in the e-ink devices, that's for sure. And guess what? It doesn't look much better in the Kindle Fire either. It's, it's doing something weird and chopping off that same exact column and actually showing even less of it. So it doesn't look good at all. And what does Amazon have to say about this? Well, I'll tell you. I pulled some guidelines from their uh, January 2013 specifications for the Kindle Direct Publishing Program. 
to make a long story short, they say if a user has to basically pan to the right or left to see the entire table, that is, quote, a poor user experience, which means if you've got a table that's more than three columns wide, you're going to be creating, quote, a poor user experience. Thanks a lot, Amazon. Thanks a lot. Um, they also say don't put large pictures in your tables. And there may be some cases where you basically need to convert a table to an image and stick that in there. Well, let me show you kind of what that looks like and how that works. Not well, as you can imagine. This table comes from our Technical Writing 101 book. We have a table that shows the diacritical marks for, um, for editing. In the editing chapter of that book, this will show people what editing on paper used to be like because it's not done much anymore. We have in the example column, as you can see, images uh, to show those marks in action. And in the very left column, we show the symbol and an image showing by itself. It looks horrible. I tinkered with this and tinkered with this and tinkered with this. I could not get it to look right to save my life. So I actually broke down and did the dirty deed. I took a screenshot of that table and put it into the book. To this day, looking at that right there, which you're seeing, I feel dirty looking at it because there are so many reasons this is a bad idea. First of all, even though I put in alt text for those images for that image for that table, the Kindle text to speech feature, which will read your book to you, it skips right over images and it doesn't read the alt text. So basically, if you are say visually impaired or just, just want to hear your book and don't want to read it, you are not going to get the information that is in these weird screenshotted tables that may be very important. Uh, you know, their suggestion is, well, you can kind of uh, not put it in tabular format. And I actually did that for another book. So, um, I have actually broken down and detabilified content, but the only time I've ever taken the screenshot was here, and like I said, it doesn't make me happy, and I think it's a very poor suggestion on Amazon's part because it, it's not good for so many, so many reasons, accessibility being the primary one. So with all this information about the problems with displays, all your different distribution options. What is a publisher to do? My first piece of advice is test on as many devices as you can get your hands on. Get as many free applications as you can. Borrow your friends and family's e-readers. Test your EPUB files on as many EPUBs, uh, EPUB readers as you can. Um, as far as Kindle goes, please download their Kindle Previewer and look at that content in every single different type of device because even within the Kindle family, things can look really different. And the Previewer will help give you an idea of what that's like. Um, that said, if you already have a Kindle, use it too because I, did, I have noticed sometimes there is some difference between what's on the emulator and what actually shows up on my device. So keep that in mind too. Um, after you do some testing, you may need to make some changes to kind of find a middle ground that displays decently across all devices. And that's what I, I've done in the past. I've made something, shall we say, less designery and more vanilla. Um, for example, I'm thinking very strongly about getting rid of our um, custom fonts in the EPUB files, first of all, uh, the iPad ignores them, and so they're useless there. So do I really want to include them, uh, especially considering if I use that EPUB file to create my Kindle file, they're also useless there too, and would increase the file size of my Kindle edition if I left them in there. So I'm thinking long and hard about ditching custom fonts. Um, when I do edit an EPUB file, because sometimes you do need to touch little things up here and there, I use the Oxygen XML editor. 
uh, through Oxygen, you can actually open up and modify the individual files within the EPUB, and that includes the style sheets that control formatting. I find that very useful, and it's a really great perk uh, of that uh, XML authoring tool. It's not its primary purpose. I use it mostly for coding and XML, but it is very handy with EPUBs. There are some other choices for editing. Uh, including an open source EPUB editor called Sigil, and that's S-I-G-I-L. That's another possibility uh, for editing and touching up EPUB files. When it comes to evaluating your distribution options, think long and hard about whether exclusivity is going to work for you. Can you really reach your audience if you go just to Apple, just to Amazon? Uh, do the perks of being uh, exclusive to one of those two uh, distributors uh, help you out? Uh, you may, you know, you may not want to try and create an EPUB file, you know, converting it. You may want to do something with that uh, iBooks Author multi-touch program. You know, if you want to try that out, it may be worth it to you because you've got a you know, a nice program with an interface to create your iBook, uh, your, your EPUB, well, not an EPUB file, your, your multi-touch book, which is really an EPUB file, but we've already talked about that. Um, you may like the idea of having your content uh, released through Amazon's uh, lending library. That may be something you're really interested in, but then again, if you want to do that, it locks you down to Amazon. So think about that. Exclusive distribution doesn't have to be just through Apple or Amazon. It can be just through your own, own site. But that means you've got to go through all the rigmarole of figuring out how you're going to sell it, you know, do your credit card processing. Um, so you've got to figure out what it's going to cost you in transaction fees, monthly fees, whatever else, to run those cards. And as Sarah and I often say to our clients, do a business case. Uh, you got to do the same thing here. Uh, do some back of the envelope count calculations and figure out, uh, you know, is it really in your best interest, time-wise and money-wise, to excel exclusively yourself? It does take a lot of time and energy, and you've also got to be aware of the regulations surrounding credit card processing because they are definitely there. Finally, realize that some of your content may not be a good fit for devices. I showed you all those examples of those wide tables from the State of Structure Authoring Report, what they look like in Kindle Previewer. Because of my previous experience with tables, I already knew that that book was going to be a no-go on the Kindle. And as you could see, by the, because of those wide tables, which, were through, which are throughout that book, it is not a good fit. We opted not to release that state of structured authoring report as a Kindle edition. Uh, basically, don't try to fit a round peg in a square hole. It's just not worth it. If you have any questions for me you'd like to ask privately, you can drop me an email at asp at scriptorium.com. I am also on Twitter at Alan Pringle. I uh, just want to run down a few useful resources about ebook and ebook distribution uh, on Scriptorium's blog. Uh, I have written several articles, blog posts about the business issues surrounding distribution. Uh, I do highly recommend Liz Castro, uh, pigsgoardsandwikis.com. Her blog is full of information. She also has several e uh, how-to ebooks. They can give you some really good information, for example, about how to embed video uh, and audio in your content. We actually use one of her books to determine that we did not want to do uh, any video clips in one of our books simply because you have to consider all the different um, file formats for videos and what works on different devices. And as you can imagine, it's kind of all over the place, so we decided not to deal with that challenge at this time. Uh, if you want to validate your EPUB, upload it to validator.idpf.org. Uh, I also recommend the forums at mobilereadcom There's some really good information out there. Uh, you can also find some good information uh, under the eProduction hashtag on Twitter. So, questions and comments.
Um, let me take a look and see what we've got here. I think Alan, I do have some questions sure. that, that I wanted to drop in for you. Uh, for those of you that are on the call, you have a questions tab or module or area, depending on how you define it, and go to webinar. And if you have questions, do feel free to drop them in there, and we'll try and get to them before we run out of time here. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions that are, we've talked a little bit both about corporate publishing and about sort of commercial publishing, you know, put books you're putting out there to get money versus books you're putting out there because it's your responsibility to publish because you're, let's say, a technical communication group. Are there any differences in terms of strategy or in terms of approach that you've seen between those two? Well, if you're doing publishing like we're press, you know, we are looking to make some money off of these books. We have to set up the mechanism for selling. With a more corporate point of view, for example, if you were putting up technical publications as EPUBs, one thing you might want to think about is, for example, what is the target audience, uh, your target audience, do you know what particular EPUB reader they may use more frequently? If so, you may be able to you know, design your content for that. If you know you've got like 85% plus is going to be using an iPad or that's, you know, what has been dictated corporately at a company, then you need to be sure your stuff's going to look good on an iPad. There's something else you need to think about too, though, and that is file size. If you have got enormous images in your EPUB files, uh, it may take a little while for your um, users to download the EPUB versions, so you need to think about that. It's kind of the same thing with you know, enormous PDFs. You're not doing your customers any favors if you're locking stuff up in these huge files that take forever to download. So the, I guess the follow-on to that, there's a question here about EPUB. Uh, who is actually using it other than us? Um, this particular question says, I don't see many of them in my circle. Are there EPUBs out there? Do we have any sense of what the market share looks like? I'm kind of surprised by that question. Who is actually using EPUB? Um, a lot of people are using EPUB. And I, that is kind of the de facto standard now, so I'm not quite sure I understand the question. It is the primary uh, distribution method, uh, especially if you look under the covers. Even if you look at, for example, the KF8 format, uh, Amazon, and if you look at the iBooks Author multi-touch books, underneath the surface, those are truly EPUBs, whether or not Apple and Amazon want to admit it, but they are. So anybody that downloads a KF8 file is technically downloading EPUB. It's in there, sure is, with the Mobi file to boot. What, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, because it seems like it's just an enormous mess right now. It is an enormous mess. It is absolutely an enormous mess. Um, and to be honest, while a lot of people were glad that Apple or excuse me, Amazon sort of moved towards standards with their KF8 creation, they're still not calling it an EPUB. I mean, yeah, they're getting closer to standards by implementing that. And I don't see Apple and Amazon giving up any exclusivity to make life easier for publishers. They're going to do whatever they can to drive as many readers to their sites. So I wish I could say that it's going to get better and everything's going to be standards-based, but with Apple and Amazon having such large stakes involved in this, I don't see it happening, unfortunately, right? At least not in the near future. So there are a couple of follow-on questions to that having to do with formatting. Um, one is, <clears throat> so if KF8 contains an EPUB, does that mean you could read a KF8 file in a plain EPUB reader? No. <laughs> it's, got, <laughs> it's got a proprietary wrapper. Amazon is not going to be that nice to you. No. <laughs> right. And so the wrapper is, it's basically Amazon's DRM, right, that's wrapped around it? More or less. And um, it's even worse with Apple's version. They've added just a few things. I believe extensions to the style sheets that control formatting, for example that make those files unreadable on other EPUB readers. Okay, another question here about HTML5 and fixed layout EPUB, and is that viable at this point? Um, from a specification point of view, yeah, you can do it, but the problem is right now, as far as, far as I know, and we haven't really messed with this, I have to admit, 
Um, there are so few readers right now that completely handle the um, EPUB 3 spec, which does have HTML5 running underneath the hood. Um, I, right now, um, I'm going to say in the future it will be better, but for right now, as far as EPUB goes, I'm going to say mm, I'd be careful with that. Hmm. Um, okay, and you've got a couple of, you've got the events listed here. Yes, we have some events coming up. Sarah told you about them earlier. You can go to scriptorium.com slash events to register for them. We've got the round table with Scott Abel and some other leading industry professionals on April 30th. We've got a guest presenter talking about how you can use data to solve your localization problems on May 14th. Uh, and you can say hello to Sarah if you're going to be at the STC Summit in Atlanta in May. She'll be presenting at the Adobe Day event that precedes the conference, and will also Which be is free. Speaking. What was that? Which is free. Which is free. Uh, she will also be speaking at the conference itself on May 8th. Yeah, and uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up for today. Alan, thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you everyone for coming. Uh, if you do have other questions, please feel free to drop them you know, directly over to Alan or send them to info at Scriptorium, which will reach him eventually. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on another event. Thank you all.